Welcome back, everyone, to the uh, third session uh, after the lecture by Professor Joanna Menger. So she will continue talking about understanding condo effect from ADS-CFD using ADS-CFD and holography. So please. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me back. So now today I'm going to share again. So this is a PDF note. So uh, let me go to, let me try full screen. But can you see my, my mouse moving? Uh, yes. He, we, I see the mouse, but I cannot see the movement. Can you move it again? I move it. No, it I moving? don't see. No, I don't see oh, the movement. It's not moving. OK, well, then maybe. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, well. Oh, now, now I can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. No, yeah. it's not full screen, but it's pretty large. So hopefully it's OK. Yeah. All right, let me go. So um, yes, so uh, yesterday I started by introducing um, the condom model and uh, its description in conformal field theory. And uh, so um, the idea is now to find a, a holographic dual of this model. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, how to construct this. And uh, so I'm going to begin by some very general remarks about uh, duality. And I know you had the lectures by Professor Konrad Schalm, and I'm sure he explained quite a bit about these things, but maybe um, I should go over some aspects of holography just a little bit because um, these will um, um, be maybe a bit complementary to what you heard before, because I'm much more insisting on this brain picture of holography, which um, plays an important role in constructing these condo models. Um, so today, so say the first half of the lecture, I'm, I'm just going to make some remarks about the ADS-CFT correspondence in general and, and then apply it to, to the condom model that we had yesterday. So that's the plan. Okay, so um, let me just make a few remarks about dualities in, in general. So, I mean, this word duality appears in, in many contexts in, in, in physics. Uh, and in mathematics, of course, as well. So and uh, so now here we're going to talk about dualities a lot. And um, I um, would like to present a definition of duality, which uh, is pretty general. Uh, but this is what we're actually going to mean uh, when we talk about the condo model later on. So uh, we so a duality means in, in the context of this lecture, and also probably more generally that uh, we can consider the following situation that there is a physical theory that has two equivalent formulations um, in the sense that the dynamics are the same and there's a one-to-one -one map between the states uh, in, in the two theories. So um, I, I quite like this picture. So uh, a duality means that we have some physical system which uh, can be something pretty applied. I mean, later this will be some system of brains in, in string theory, but okay, it could be also something in your lab, for instance. Um, and then you have two different theories, which are either given by an action with, uh, in particle physics or Hamiltonian in condensed matter physics. And then just assume that there's two different actions or Hamiltonians um, written in terms of different variables that nevertheless describe the same physical system. So if you have two theories that describe the same physical system, then obviously they must be related to each other. <coughs> and uh, this, this relation is precisely what is called a, a duality. Okay, so, and, and, um, so this will show up quite a bit in, in my lectures today. <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so now, um, this duality appears actually quite a bit in physics, especially there's models in um, two-dimensional quantum field theory, like the uh, massive Thuring model and the sine gordon model, which display precisely such a duality. Now, the special thing about gauge gravity duality is that this is the only known example so far where there's a, a duality in, in the sense that I described before where you have a map between a quantum field theory, which does not have gravity, and on the other side of the duality, so the second theory is a, is a gravity theory in higher dimensions. So that makes this duality very special because it really make, provides a map between a quantum theory without gravity and a, a gravity um, theory. 
So um, this, all, of course, means a lot of progress in the context of uh, of quantum gravity. And uh, I mean, if we really push this to the extreme, we might say that uh, gravity is then kind of an emergent theory because it's equivalent to a quantum field theory without gravity. I wouldn't go quite as far. Um, I, I, I still think that gravity is somehow fundamental. Uh, but uh, of course, that, that's kind of something you could deduce from this if you really take it to the extreme. Okay, we have to be aware, of course, that in, in ADS-CFT, uh, the cosmological constant is negative, and that's not what happens in the real world and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, conceptually, I think this is an interesting question to discuss. Um, okay, so then we should always be aware, of course, that ADS-CFT and gauge gravity duality so far is a conjecture. I mean, there is no proof. And uh, <clears throat> the reason why there's no proof that really it's a conjecture about uh, string theories and quantum theories of gravity, uh, which are strongly coupled, and we just don't know how to describe those in detail. And so that's um, why um, there's not really a proof yet. Uh, but uh, in the context of this talk, it will be important that um, it's a conjecture which follows from a low energy limit of, of string theory, and there will be quite some string theory constructions coming up shortly. Okay, then uh, we have to recall that <clears throat> duality, of course, um, also means that there is a map between weak and strong coupling. And, and that's also exactly uh, what's happening in engaged gravity duality. So we have a strongly coupled quantum field theory, uh, which will be mapped to a theory of gravitation at weak coupling. And um, okay, so this means also something for the quantum model. <clears throat> if we so we will consider the quantum model shortly, and um, um, so yesterday I talked about this quantum model where the electrons are just free, but then they interact locally with um, with this uh, magnetic impurity. But here now <clears throat> it will be uh, when when we have a gravity dual, then the the, the quantum model will be slightly different in the sense that also these electrons will already be strongly interacting among themselves. Sorry, and um, <clears throat> and uh, <coughs> and um, so, so in addition to the strong, so there will be two coupling constants. One is the coupling constants between these electrons, which we didn't have yesterday. And then on top of that, we will have this uh, condo interaction with the magnetic impurity, which we discussed yesterday, okay? so just already a kind of thing to remember when we talk about gravity duals of quantum models, it will be slightly different quantum models than the ones I discussed yesterday, because the electrons will be strongly coupled even before you put these impurities. And um, of course, that's interesting because um, the, the quantum model is extremely well understood. So if we just have a gravity dual of the standard quantum model, that would be maybe not so instructive, but now we can have uh, quantum models where also the electrons are strongly interacting with each other. Okay, so this is something new now in this in this model. And um, so then, of course, uh, I also have to mention holography. So and, and this will also come to play when we think about the gravity dual of the condom model, because um, so holography means that there's a relation between different dimensions and. So we have a quantum field theory in d dimensions, which is dual to a gravitational theory in d plus one dimensions. And we can consider the quantum field theory to be located at the boundary of this uh, higher dimensional gravitational space. Okay, so this means, for the quantum model, this means that uh, yesterday, so we had a, quantum, a conformal field theory in one plus one dimensions, and then there was a defect in zero plus one dimensions. So now if we have a gravity dual of the condo model, this means we will have uh, a theory in two plus one dimensions with a defect in one plus one dimensions. Okay, so both objects get one additional dimension. Okay, okay. Um, now let me talk a little bit about um, ADS-CFT and I'm sure everybody's already heard about it and is quite familiar, but just to recall some facts that will be very relevant for constructing our, our condom model. 
Okay, so, so gauge gravity duality is now a very general concept, uh, as I explained uh, with this picture just a few slides ago. So, um, um, okay, so let's go to this. So, so this, can, this can be actually quite general. And the way why ADS CFT works so well is because th there's the same amount of degrees of freedom on each of, in each of the theories due to the holographic principle. And also the symmetry is match on the two sides. Okay. And, uh, but of course, this idea of making the symmetries match on the two sides, uh, this, this can be uh, realized much more generally, and we can deform the original ADS CFT correspondence or add some extra features. And um, so, um, okay, so, but in, in the best understood example, there's really loads of, so as proposed by Malaseno and already some time ago, um, there's, um, it's the best understood example because there are so many symmetries. Okay, so uh, we have an anti sitter space, um, which is a space of constant negative curvature, which has a boundary, and the isometries of the space um, have the same symmetry group as um, um, the conformal group in one dimension lower. Okay, so now what will be very important for my talk is that um, because um, the ADS CFT correspondence comes from superstring theory. Uh, and then, in total, we will have 10 dimensions, okay, not just five. And there will also be an internal manifold um, to make up these 10 dimensions. <clears throat> and this internal manifold, uh, in the simplest case, is just a five dimensional sphere, but this could also be something more complicated. And actually, the symmetries of this internal manifold will determine additional symmetries of the fields in, in this conformal field theory. So, um, and, and um, so the, the best understood example where there's a duality here, <clears throat> there will be an N equals four super young Mills theory, uh, which has an R symmetry and this R symmetry is SU4. <clears throat> SU4 is isometric, uh, isomorphic to uh, SO6, which is the symmetry of the S5. So this S5, the symmetries of this S5, will determine additional global symmetries of our conformal field theory. Um, okay. Um, so there's more symmetry than just the conformal symmetry, but of course we, we do have the, the conformal symmetry, which uh, comes from the isometries of this um, ADS space. And um, so if we just use the Euclidean signature just for, for one moment, uh, then the, the global symmetry group of the isometries of this ADS D plus one will be SO D plus one comma one. And uh, this will be the same uh, symmetry th that also the operators in uh, D-dimensional CFT have. Okay, yeah, this is always a, a nice picture of an anti sitter space, which I, which I like very much, which is due to, to Escher. So, uh, you know, it's this um, kind of infinitely extended cylinder. And so here, this is a cut, a constant uh, cut in time. And um, so the negative curvature um, appears through a projection. So these angels and devils, they, they all have the same area. And because the space is negatively curved, um, they appear much uh, smaller at the, uh, at the boundary than the interior, but really they all have the same surface, uh, surface and, um, and the structure arises from the negative, negative curvature. Okay, then another way of uh, depicting this is a slightly more uh, mathematical way. Um, so um, ADS space is a hyperbolic space of constant negative curvature. And uh, so you can uh, think of an hyperboloid uh, inscribed in, in this cone in this way. So the blue surface is really our anti sitter space and it extends all the way to infinity. And it's really at infinity where, where this boundary is located here. And uh, so um, this is obtained by um, uh, embedding um, ADSD plus one into uh, one higher dimensional space. And so um, this blue surface is actually a solution of this equation, which almost looks like the equation of a sphere, except for the two minus signs, which appear here. Okay. Um, now the metric, which is best to, to use to, to describe um, ADS uh, in the context that I'm going to present uh, is the, the metric on the, the Poincaré patch. So Poincaré patch that we really just cover one half of this um, anti sitter space. Okay, so it's not a global, but rather a local coordinate system. 
And um, so, so here, these coordinates x are the Minkowski coordinates at the boundary. And then we have an extra coordinate, which is the radial coordinate of the anti visitor space. And it appears here in a, in a wall factor. And then, of course, we have also the uh, differential for this extra coordinate. And, and this L here is precisely the same L as there. And uh, so this is the so-called anti dissertar radius. OK, uh, let me say just a few words about conformal field theories. Well, there was quite a lot about conformal field theories yesterday in one plus one dimensions. But um, of course, there's also conformal symmetry in higher dimensions. But there, it's a bit different because the conformal group is just uh, finite. OK, so the conformal field theory is a quantum field theory in which the fields transform covariantly under conformal transformations, so which are given by this group. And um, so conformal coordinate transformations are those that preserve angles locally in this form. So then I can talk a little bit about my PhD thesis, so, uh, which Dong Hyuk is very familiar. <laughs> so, um, and this is a very strong symmetry, which means that the correlation functions uh, are determined up to a very small number of parameters, even if we're in uh, higher dimensions. And, um, <clears throat> and so an important concept here is the so-called operator product expansion. So the, the three-point function <clears throat> um, in, in this uh, conformal field theory are determined uh, by, by these coefficients C. <clears throat> and um, so they really determine the entire structure of the quantum field theory. <coughs> Sorry. And <clears throat> so the important point is that um, if we have this um, anti dissertar correspondence, um, ADS CFT correspondence, which comes from the, the entire 10 dimensional space, so the, the ADS space itself and its symmetries just give us the fact that we have a conformal field theory. But then if we want to know which conformal field theory and which Lagrangian for this conformal field theory, then we need these internal symmetries. And um, so uh, if we have this S5, which I mentioned before, let me just show again um, this one, uh, then we know exactly the Lagrangian of the dual P theory and it's, um, it's NX to four super young Wills theory. So um, a very special quantum field theory, but which is still a renormalizable well understood uh, quantum field theory. Okay, so just to remind you about the symmetries and also the importance of these inner space, um, which make up the full 10 dimensions. <clears throat> I, I also want you to remind you about a few basic facts of, uh, about string theory, because they will also be important for constructing um, this uh, condo, holographic condo model. And um, so, as I said, um, the ADS-CFT correspondence comes from string theory. And in string theory, there's two types of degrees of freedom. We have open and closed strings. OK, um, I, I just reviewed this. I, I hope you have heard these things uh, already at some point. Um, <clears throat> so the, the open strings, they, they are related to the gauge degrees of freedom, <clears throat> like the ones in the standard model of particle physics. And the closed strings, um, they, they are related to gravitation. And the reason is really that uh, the massless modes associated to an open string um, is a spin one field, which is like a gauge field, whereas here the massless mode is a quadrupole fluctuation. And um, so that's a spin two um, tensor fluctuation and that corresponds to a metric field. Okay, so and the duality in the sense, as I introduced at the beginning of the lecture, in this case, will be a duality between a description of brains in the open and the closed uh, string picture. Okay, so very important uh, for the ADS CFT correspondence and also for the duality for the condo model are the D brains. <coughs> so these are essentially surfaces embedded into the nine plus one dimensional space. <coughs> Uh, determined by Dirichlet boundary conditions, or so this Dirichlet boundary conditions enters this D. And uh, so these are really surfaces on which open strings can end. And um, so the dynamics of these strings will then also provide the dynamics of this um, entire construction here of the entire brain. And of course, um, if we are after a three plus one dimensional series, the, the most important brains are the so-called D3 brains. 
and three constant number of spatial dimensions. So this is a three plus one dimensional surface that we have here, for instance. Okay. Um, so, and now in the idea CFT correspondence, there's an important low energy limit in which the strings become point like. And uh, so um, then essentially, uh, when the string in this limit where the strings, so you go very far away or the resolution gets very low because you go to low energies and then your extended objects look like points. And then in that case, uh, the dynamics of the open strings just becomes the dynamics of some gauge fields on the brain. And that's exactly how you get this NX24 super young mill theory in the open string picture of the three brains. Um, but then there's also a second interpretation of D brains uh, in the sense that they are solitonic solutions of 10 dimensional supergravity. So, which means that they are heavy objects uh, that curve the space around them. And uh, so there will be a duality between these two. Okay, so, and that brings us to this picture of the um, string theory origin of the ADS CFT correspondence. So, again, in this example of these three brains, so we consider these three brains uh, in 10 dimensional space. And uh, now there's an open, closed string duality, but the duality, this word duality is still used exactly in the same sense as I used uh, earlier on the second slide of my lecture. Um, and so, so we have a we can describe the, the D brains with open strings and with closed strings, uh, but in fact we are just describing the same physical object. So um, the, the two descriptions have to be related to each other. And um, so there's this open string discussion uh, description, uh, which in the low energy limit uh, gives us um, a supersymmetric SUN gauge theory in four dimensions, namely this NX24 superhero mist theory. And uh, an important uh, ingredient of this low energy limit is that um, the rank of the gauge group, so SUN has to go to infinity. So the rank of the gauge group is given by the number of brains that are coincident here. And um, so the same low energy limit. Um, in, in, in this closed string gravity picture where we have these solitonic solutions um, gives rise to, 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 to the space of ADS five times S5. So the, here we view the brains as being heavy objects curving the space around them. And they, if you do the calculation of this uh, low energy limit, you precisely get this geometry of ADS five times S5 that uh, we discussed before. And then here, the, the low energy excitations will be uh, closed strings, okay, so gravitons. And uh, so here we have a nice picture of this duality of a description in terms of gauge fields, and here there's a description in terms of gravity fields. And so if there is a duality at the level of string theory, then there should also be a, a duality here. And uh, <clears throat> So then this low energy limit will include both taking uh, the number of brains to infinity, which means that the rank of the gauge group is infinite, but also the, the coupling has to be taken to infinity. So this will be a strongly coupled theory. And uh, the fact that N goes to infinity means that here we get a, uh, not a quantum, but a classical string theory. And then the fact that the coupling is very large um, tells us that we have point-like particles, so supergravity rather than super string theory, which is much more manageable. Okay, and this picture uh, I, um, leads now to, to the following uh, dictionary. So uh, really what we have, so this is uh, just a cartoon of an <laughs> anti I mean, it's not quite correct because really this is an, um, a non-compact space. Okay, this hyperbolic space. <clears throat> Just for simplicity, I drew this as some curved space like this, but it's not quite that what it looks like. Um, so where, okay, so we have here some space with a boundary and this boundary, we just have Minkowski space time where we define some quantum field theory, but then there's an extra dimension uh, in which makes up this anti sitter space time. And um, so a key ingredient now of this duality that there's really a one-to-one -one map between objects in the two theories. So there's a dictionary where we have gauge invariant uh, field theory operators here in this quantum theory that uh, which have a one-to-one -one map to classical fields in the gravity theory. And this map uh, really comes from, from the symmetry. So they're in the same representation of the big symmetries that we have, okay? So, um, 
essentially the ADS-CFT correspondence then means that we identify the generating functionals on the two sides of the correspondence. Okay, and there are many tests of this. In particular, we can calculate correlation functions on the two sides and subject to some non-renormalization theorems, we get the same results on the two sides. Okay, so now I can just put this words into an equation and I'm sure you have uh, seen this before. So there's this field operator correspondence. So I have a generating functional for correlation functions of particular composite operators in the quantum field theory. And this uh, generating functional now coincides with the classical tree diagram generating functional in the supergravity. And so the sources here for these operators, they are identified with the boundary values essentially of, of the gravity fields. So in this way, we can write this duality in, in, in the terms of an equation. Okay, um, let me just summarize this because all of this will come back. I will talk about the condom model again in uh, two minutes, and, and but all of this uh, will play an important role when I um, discuss how to establish this gravity dual of the condom model. So, um, so really, the, the gauge gravity duality or ADS-CFT is a duality at the level of quantum uh, string theory, <clears throat> uh, strongly coupled, so which is uh, very hard to describe. So, but really, it's a duality between a particular gauge theory, SUN gauge theory, without gravity, and a strongly coupled theory of quantum gravity. But then, um, as uh, Maldasina proposed, there's actually two limits that can be taken. One is to take the large n limit, and one is to take the strong coupling limit. And both these limits, um, well, so the fact that we take um, a large n limit means that we get a classical theory here. And um, so the fact that it's strongly coupled means that we get point like particles. And this will now just be some theory described by general relativity. And that's, of course, uh, pretty tractable. We just have to solve the equations of motion of the theory. So, and then if the conjecture duality holds at this level, it should also hold at this level. And here we can really now use gravity to uh, describe strongly correlated systems. <laughs> I mean, so this was derived for, for um, quantum field theories and, and in particular NX24 super young wheels. But we can generalize this um, to many other situations for like, for instance, the, the condo model. Okay. All right. So this I mentioned many times, but just let me emphasize one more time. So this internal manifold, which we have on top of the anti dissidus space, will play an important role. And its uh, symmetries also give you another global symmetries um, act, which also determines the field content of, of the dual field theory. OK, so this internal space will come up quite a bit. OK. So now let me make a, one further remark. So I will talk about condom model again in two minutes. <laughs> Sorry, if you think this is a very long digression, but um, uh, I, I want to point out one thing. So there's different two different approaches which you can take to gauge gravity duality, which are called top down and bottom up. And uh, both of them are very relevant, uh, but they have slightly different aims. And uh, so let me just contrast them to each other. Okay, so here mostly I'm going to talk, well, first I'm going to talk about top down, but then I will also turn to a bottom up module. Okay, so top down means that we begin with a string theory in, in 10 dimensions. So this me and the advantage of this that is that everything is under a lot of control. Okay, so we have the Lagrangian of the dual field theory is known. So in the example I talked about before, it's um, index to four super young mill theory. And there are only very few parameters. I mean, essentially, there will be essentially one scale that, that shows up. Okay. So this is a model where there's a lot of control. But on the other hand, it's very rigid and very strict. I mean, there's not a lot of freedom that you can choose, which sometimes is an advantage, but sometimes also it's maybe not what you would like. And then uh, there's the bottom up models, which I mean, they, they are quite, quite used quite uh, extensively also in, in applications of ADS-CFT to condense matter physics. Um, and so here, the idea is that um, one just works with deformations of the anti sitter space and this internal space is ignored. So the one that I just mentioned, so this one, okay. Um, 
so then obviously the calculations will be a lot simpler and there's a lot more freedom so so we can choose more features that fit the models that we would like to describe um but um, we pay a price on the price prices that we don't know what the lagrangian of the dual field theory is okay so the, the duality is much less explicit than in this case that i just described to you so we only know the global symmetries of the dual field theory but we don't know the lagrangian and um, um, sometimes this is not doesn't matter because we're just interested in universal features okay where the individual microscopic degrees of freedom are not so relevant um, so um, if we just describe say transport in a strongly correlated system uh, th this uh, might not be such a problem because there's this fact that uh, in ADS CFT this happens quite a lot of time for instance, if you remember this calculation of the shear viscosity over entropy density, this is a very nice example. So where really the, the results don't depend on the microscopic degrees of freedom. On the other hand, um, just for conceptual reasons, it may actually be nice to have a duality where you can really write down the two Hamiltonians or Lagrangians of the two theories that are dual to each other. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk quite a bit about this, but then unfortunately, we will come up with a model which is so complicated that we can't solve it and then we just get rid of some complicated features and also write down a bottom-up model on, on basis on the basis of this top-down one okay so that will be the strategy for um, deriving our uh, gravity dual for the condo model okay um, so this was a super general introduction about ads cft but i hope i made clear a few important points which we will need for for the gravity dual of the condo model okay so because we really want to have control of our lagrangian um, like the one we had yesterday you know with the kinetic term and this local interaction term with the with the impurity but then on the other hand if we want to actually do some calculations we will have to simplify our model and then we just end up with some particular bottom up model as well Okay, so now I'm going to talk yeah. about the condom model again, but are there any questions about this general part? So, Joanna? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, here in the bottom of approach, how do you know about global symmetry? Is it about internal space information? Or global symmetry here means always internal symmetry? Or Yeah, well, okay, so um, the, the, the prototype example is if you take... Um, if, if you don't just take the Eiltrain Hilbert action, but you add um, some gauge field on the gravity side. And then if this gauge field has, say, a U1 symmetry, then you have a global U1 symmetry also in your field theory. Okay. So that's for, for condensed matter applications, that's the most useful example because uh, you want a charged uh, theory at the boundary. Okay. So then, and it's a general feature that if you have a, a gauge symmetry in the bulk, it will give rise to a local symmetry at the boundary. So in that sense, I, I mean here that only global symmetries are known. So, so the prototype example would be to say, okay, I have an Einstein-Hilbert term, and then I take a gauge field with a, with a U1 symmetry, and then I know that I have a global U1 in the boundary theory. Does it always mean some isometry for internal space, or it can be? Well, you know, KL, no, I don't no, I don't think so. It it can just mean um, it can just mean uh, a gauge symmetry of some field. I mean, without needing the, the internal symmetries. I I will show an example now for the condom model. I can come back to this point if you like. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, anything else? Okay, I think it will become more clear if we if we look at um, examples. <clears throat> okay, so so one thing is um, uh, that we can describe RG flows um, by um, okay. So I, I said the the isometries of this ADS space they they fix uh, the symmetries of the conformal field theory. So but sometimes we want an RG flow, for instance. So at some point we want to break the conformal symmetry. And, and then we have to reduce the number of isometries of this original ADS5. And this we can just literally do by taking a space which is less symmetric, which should still be a solution to the gravity equations of motion, of course. And then there's this nice concept that this extra dimension that we have 
corresponds to an energy uh, scale. Okay. And also the supersymmetry can be broken um, by, by deforming this uh, five sphere that I was mentioning before. Okay, so now um, the, the central ingredient also for the condom model is, is these uh, uh, flavor fields in the ads -CFT correspondence, okay? So I mentioned already D brains quite a lot. And so the original construction is that we have these three brains. But now <clears throat> what we can do is to embed additional brains into, um, into this uh, D3 brain geometry. So into this ADS five times is five. And um, so that's interesting because then we can, so here, let me just show how this works and, and then explain. So, so if these are the 10 dimensions of our space, so this is time and then nine uh, space dimensions, then <clears throat> in the original, case we had n d3 brains stretching in these directions <clears throat> but now uh, we can put a small number say of of the seven brains which will stretch in those directions so that we can do both on the field theory and on the gravity side on the gravity side and this essentially means that this d7 brain will fit this will be this blue object so it fills all of the anti sitter space and then essentially it wraps here, you can see an S3 inside DS5. And uh, this can fluctuate and this will be, this fluctuations give rise to uh, bound states in, in, the, in the dual field theory. So like kind of mesons, okay? And the, the, the nice thing about this construction is that in this way you can have quarks or for, for the condom model, we can have electrons. Um, because um, these quarks or electrons will be given <clears throat> by open strings which stretch between these two brains. And um, so a quark or electron transforms in the fundamental representation of the gauge group, not in the, um, in the adjoint. So in this NX2-4 super young width theory that I mentioned before, all the fields transform in the adjoint representation. But now if we want quarks or electrons, they only transform in the fundamental. And um, so to obtain fields in the fundamental, um, we, we can obtain this by adding these additional uh, brain probes. So in anything I'm going to do, uh, these extra brains will just be a probe, which means that they don't deform, the, I, I ignore the back reaction of these brains on the original geometry. And this means um, that um, there will be um, the, the, the original geometry will still be ADS five times as five. It's not going to be deformed by the presence of these brains. Okay, let me give you some, some more details about this. So again, this is the simplest case of the D3 brains. So now let's look at geometry where the zero, one, two, three direction uh, go like in this direction, four, five, six, seven in this direction and eight, nine are, are pointing towards you. And then our ND3 brains that I mentioned before, they will sit on, on this line here, okay? And uh, now the DC7 uh, brain, this blue object uh, will look like this. So it will be extended in, in also in the four, five, six, seven directions. And now the point will be that on top of the original open closed string duality that I just explained to you, there will be another duality between open strings, okay? And um, so now there will be degrees of freedom with corresponding to strings, which are have one end on the D3 brain and one end on the D7 brain. And so um, if a string has, the, the endpoints of the strings are charged. So if they are attached to this particular brain, they, they will transform uh, under the gauge symmetry associated to this uh, brains. But here you can see that they will be um, fundamental fields. Okay, because they have only one. So this will give rise to an adjoint field because both ends points of the string are attached to the D3 brains. But this will just be a field in the fundamental representation of the gauge group because only one end of this quark uh, string is attached to the D3 brain. And here, the other one is attached to the D7 brains. And um, because we take this um, particular limit where we have a small amount of these blue uh, probe brains and um, again, take the standard Maldacena limit, then this will reduce to a global symmetry again. Okay, so, um, so and in this way, we can introduce a flavor symmetry into our model. 
Okay, so the green duality is the one which I described to you before. So between NX24 uh, super young Mill theory and supergravity on ADS5 times S5. But now um, in the simplest case where we still keep all the supersymmetry, um, we have um, so th this blue brain breaks supersymmetry by half and then we get a, a fundamental hypermultiplet. Fundamental means it's uh, fields in the fundamental representation of the gauge group. And uh, so they will come from these red degrees of freedom. And then as proposed in this paper by Kachin Katz already now 20 years ago, uh, the dual description of this will correspond to the fluctuations of the brain. So I have drawn this here in a better picture. So these fluctuations here, um, they, they will correspond um, to modes dual uh, to, to um, these uh, meson fields made from bilinears of these quarks, okay? And so these fluctuations are described by the so-called dirac born infeld action. So the dirac born infeld action describes the fluctuations of, of this blue brain in this higher dimensional space. And uh, so, so this will give us extra modes which are dual to these um, um, fundamental fields. Okay, so this was used quite a lot in the last 20 years also to describe some uh, phenomena in QCD, um, like mesons, chiral symmetry breaking, and so on. So, so I've been working quite a lot on this, but now it will also be very important for our condo model. Are there any questions about this picture? Because I mean, this will be the essential ingredient for building a holographic condo model. Joanna? Yeah. The quark should be fermionic. Can you comment on this? Aspect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, the modes, yeah, quarks are fermionic, but in ADSCFT, anyway, you always look at gauge invariant operators. So you would look at meson operators, which are made, say, from a quark and an anti-quark, and that will be a bosonic operator again. And, and this bosonic operator will be dual to the bosonic fluctuations of this brain. Mm -hmm. So you, you won't be able to see any power exclusion principle then? <laughs> Well, that's not quite true because, of course, there's also a fermionic contribution to the dirac born infeld action. Yeah. So you can also study fermions, but these fermions, they will be dual to composite fermions in this theory. Yeah. Um, so actually, um, um, this is also studied quite a lot. And um, so I, actually, I, I also wrote some paper on this just last year, or uh, two years ago, um, in the context of applications to particle physics, okay? So for instance, in composite Higgs models, there are composite fermions, which you described with the fermionic part of the TBI action. But then here you get some object with three fermions, <clears throat> okay? Uh, three fundamental fermions, <clears throat> but- Fermions. But, okay, but yeah. this is a standard feature of ADS-CFT. You can only describe gauge invariant operators. Yeah. Um, so, so we cannot describe individual uh, fermions which um, are not gate invariant. Um, so this is something we have to live with in ADS-CFT. I mean, <laughs> uh, there's, I mean, you know, this will be very hard to to undo. Um, but this is, I mean, this is in any calculation using ADS-CFT, you always have gate invariant operators here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, finally, okay, let's talk about condom models again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so now all of what I've been saying can now be applied to some variant of the models I was talking about yesterday. Okay, yesterday I told you what is the condo effect. So uh, just to remind you very quickly, condo effect um, relates to a screening of a magnetic impurity um, by conduction electrons at low temperatures. So that's what I explained yesterday. And now why, why would we like to have a gravity dual of this? Okay. Well, okay, so uh, there's lots of reasons. Okay. So one thing is that um, that will provide new applications of gauge gravity duality to condensed matter physics. So we can 
Uh, and the new aspect will be that the magnetic impurity that we introduce will now be coupled to a strongly correlated electron system rather than to a free electron system as we were considering yesterday. So it's a bit different from what we were talking about yesterday. And in these strongly correlated systems, now um, we can calculate quite a few interesting quantities like the entanglement entropy. We can study time dependence. Uh, we can calculate correlation functions. I, I will give you uh, quite a bit of examples also tomorrow of what we can actually do with these models. <clears throat> and uh, so there are some very interesting uh, features. And, and so I think it's important to say that this goes quite beyond the standard condo model that we discussed yesterday. And it's not just a gravity dual of the condo model I discussed yesterday, but it's really something new. Uh, because the electrons are strongly co correlated even before we put the impurity. Okay, <clears throat> um, though there's also more theoretical reasons why, why it's interesting to have such a model in gauge gravity duality. Um, so yesterday I also mentioned that um, th this model has a negative beta function for this boundary RG flow and in that sense it's a bit similar to, to QCD. And so there's this condo temperature, which is a kind of uh, corresponds to a dynamical scale generation as there is a scale in QCD. Okay, yesterday we also discussed that nevertheless, there are quite a few differences also to QCD in particular due to the fact that in, in this model now we know that there's this infrared fixed point, which we don't know in, in um, QCD. And also because we are in one plus one dimensions, we can all use all this power of two dimensional conformal field theory where um, the symmetry is infinite and <clears throat> determines entire, the entire spectrum of the theory. Okay, so, but nevertheless, uh, it's uh, also to learn something about QCD, it's interesting to have a, a gravity dual of, of this model. And um, okay, so then these points are a little more involved and in, maybe I will talk about them tomorrow. So um, we can have um, a so-called G theorem. So, so this is a variant of the so-called C theorem, where, um, which describes um, a kind of entropy function for renormalization group flows. So this is a function which decreases monotonically along RG flows. But here in this model, we have a boundary RG flow because the coupling is um, running only at the boundary. And this leads to something called the G theorem. And we can actually verify that this gravity model also satisfies such a G theorem. And um, and then also something that was mentioned by um, Mardis yesterday, um, there is actually quite a close relation to the Sachdev Kitayev model, which was extensively studied in holography. And that, that would be coming up if we had these two spins interacting with each other, as I mentioned briefly yesterday, following your question. Um, so um, the, so the, it's, it's a kind of cousin of the SYK model. And um, so in particular, there will be some properties of the spectral functions, the so-called spectral asymmetry that uh, occurs both in this SYK model and also in the models that um, I'm going to introduce to you now. Okay, so that's another interesting uh, aspect. Okay, so that already gives a, a lot of uh, reasons to, to study this in monography. So just a quick question. This, yeah. uh, if this feature that you have this in your model, uh, which is different from the previous explanation you yeah. said for condo, that is a strong recorded uh, electron system. Is it like better uh, from the point of view of experimental connection, or is just a like completely new, like different from experiment? Uh, well, okay. So I would say, of course, there there are many realizations of the condo model with free electrons, as I discussed yesterday. So yesterday I, I showed this uh, plot, which was actually in Condo's original uh, paper, where um, you know um, there's a Fermi liquid description of the electrons, and essentially there was iron with gold impurities, and that's extremely well described by this model I discussed yesterday. Okay, so for this we don't need gauge gravity duality. Um, so from the and nevertheless, um, of course, now more modern. I mean, okay, uh, okay, so. Um, that's, I mean, sometimes condensed matter physicists say, well, why do you bother about the condo model? We know mm -hmm. everything about the condo model. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the answer is, okay, that's fine. You know everything about the condo model with three electrons, but not everything is known about mm -hmm. the condo model with the interacting electrons. And 
Now, in more modern, strongly correlated materials, of course, there's also a condo effect, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and these are much harder to describe. And of course, also condensed matter physicists have a description of the condo model, um, and they lose the so-called Luttinger liquid, okay? So they, mm -hmm. they consider magnetic impurities in the Luttinger liquid. But this is yet a little bit different from the um, from the models that I'm considering here. Although this is, you know, this is I get very asked this very often by condensed matter physicists. It would be very nice to make a connection between the models that I'm going to describe and and the Luttinger liquid. Okay, so in terms of, um, so for instance, um, yesterday I mentioned that the decisive uh, experimental feature of the condom model is this uh, logarithmic uh, scaling with the temperature of the resistance. Uh -huh. But um, um, in these more strongly coupled uh, systems, it, it doesn't grow with a logarithm, but rather with some power, real power, I mean, so T to the gamma, where gamma is some real number. Okay, so and that's clearly different um, from, from this original condom model, and this is a something that can be seen in the experiment. And um, so I would say the answer to your question is this is ongoing research. Okay, so we can provide some ingredients to study condo um, impurities in strongly correlated systems. And okay, so there's also other techniques like the Hattinger liquid, and it's interesting to make connections. I mean, it's not exactly the same as we are doing here. And uh, so this can, I mean, this field of having condo effect in strongly correlated systems is much less well understood, although it also exists. I mean, people study this also experimentally. So, um, so certainly um, there's lots of experimental uh, and condensed matter applications of this model as well. And, and, and this, you know, this is more modern than the original condo model that I discussed yesterday. Okay, I hope oh, it's, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yeah. I have one question. Yeah. If the condensed system is not a Hermitian, but it has the PT symmetry, do we have a general procedure to study the, the, the holography study by some bucket geometry? Yeah, so, so if PT symmetry is broken, then, yeah, I mean, so parity symmetry is broken, then uh, we can use transformation theories, for instance. Um, so um, I think the answer is yes. I mean, you, you can also have gravity models that break PT symmetry. Um, um, yeah, so, so it is possible. And I, I maybe I, I will mention a little bit about this later on. So you so mean yes. that you can use the back, uh, back isometry to study the condensed matter's uh, quantity? Yes, 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 we can. So, so, so the, the best example is to have a, so now we will have an ADS3 space and if we have a, Transcendence term there, then it already breaks the parity symmetry. And the um, Parker system is, is a Hermitian or non Hermitian? Uh, okay, so well, in the models that I'm going to describe today and tomorrow, I think everything is Hermitian, but I know that non Hermitian um, <clears throat> um, models are very uh, topical right now. And uh, um, I do think you can also consider non Hermitian uh, theories by. Uh, uh, for instance, in introducing some time dependence and so on. Um, so, so I would say the answer is yes, but I mean, this has not yet been studied very much, but um, uh, I think uh, this can be done. Um, okay, I, I might mention, uh, make a few comments about this when, when I move along. I, I, I think the answer is <clears throat> today and tomorrow, I'm on, only going to talk about emission theories. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, um, that doesn't mean that it's impossible to do non emission It's just, I think not many people have studied this yet. It's just something that is beginning to study non emission systems also in ADS-CFT. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. Uh, all right, so let me just... Um, <clears throat> Uh, give you a slight review. I mean, okay, so I've been working on this for, for quite some years. Um, so the original model that I'm going to show to you was in this paper with uh, Carlos Hoyos and the Bannon and Jackson who already you know, some time back. And, and so this is the model that I'm first going to describe to you, uh, top down and bottom up. And um, then uh, tomorrow, well, a bit later today, but also tomorrow, then I'm going to show some applications. So we can use this to calculate so-called uh, entanglement entropy, which is a very important concept in 
ADS-CFT, you probably know about this famous Ryu Takayanagi formula, and, and this can be also used in the, when there's an impurity. And actually, we can reproduce some results of Affleck and collaborators who calculated this in conformal field theories. Uh, then uh, we also calculated two point functions, um, also together with uh, Dimitrios, Zweifel uh, Dimitrio. Uh, and uh, and, and um, so, so this gives um, um, especially the spectral functions. And so, so, so the spectral functions give us some relation to the SYK model. Uh, but also we can study, for instance, uh, properties of quantum dots such as Fano resonances and so on. So there's some very nice condensed matter applications. And, and what we also did was to look at uh, quantum quenches. So if, um, you know, if we quench this interaction with the defect, uh, what happens? And um, so, so this I'm also going to show to you. Okay, so this is uh, already, so this was a program which went into 2017, but then more recently, um, we have a new model which has a slightly different brain configuration and the advantage of this new model is that it's really top down all the way so this model we start with top down and then we say okay this model is too complicated uh, let's write a bottom up model which has some features okay of, of our orig original construction but now we have this new model um, where, where we really have the Lagrangian uh, on the two sides of the correspondence and uh, so this is also um, very interesting, and I might mention this tomorrow a little bit. Um, okay, uh, so okay, so I don't have to explain this one more time. So this is what we had yesterday uh, about the screening, and that was the the Lagrangian that uh, I wrote down yesterday. Okay, so with this local interaction. But okay, so uh, again, let me emphasize that what we discussed yesterday was about the free electron nodes, but our model now will be for strongly correlated electrons. Okay. And um, okay, I extensively discussed this um, CFT approach, but uh, let me also mention that there's solutions using the beta ansatz. And uh, in particular, I also briefly mentioned yesterday that there's a large N version of the Kondo model. And I mentioned large N already this morning, and it's a decisive feature of this limit in the ADS-CFT correspondence to bring it to this level of classical gravity where we can actually do calculations. So, um, so it's important uh, to take this large N limit. But fortunately, this has already been discussed uh, quite extensively uh, earlier. I should emphasize though that the large N limit that we take is a bit different from, from this condensed matter large n limit. It's more a matrix large n than the vector large n limit. So and that's important to keep in mind. And, and so that's one reason also why our model is a bit different from uh, what condensed matter physicists do where they have a Lattinger liquid that couples to an impurity. Okay, so because we have a, a different large n limit here. Okay, so that's what I showed to you yesterday. There was this breakdown of um, um, perturbation theory. That's the experimental plot of this logarithmic rise. And okay, so um, let me mention again that this is really a Fermi liquid feature. And um, in, in these models that I'm going to introduce now, there won't be this logarithmic behavior because of the strong coupling of the electrons. And there's rather a scale um, with T to the gamma and gamma being a real number. Okay, and, and uh, there was this issue of the scale generation, and uh, so just to remind you. Okay, now, um, as I mentioned this morning, so gauge gravity duality uh, requires large n. And uh, in, in particular, this means now that we have to consider an SUN spin and then take n to infinity. Okay, and this I already mentioned very briefly yesterday. Um, so then the idea is to write our spin operator as this bilinear in, in these so-called slave or abrikosov uh, fermions. And uh, so, so we decompose our spin operator into a bilinear of fermions, which are in the fundamental representation of this SUN. 
So you see already fundamental representation. So that's why I introduced in ADS-CFT this probe brains because they give us fundamental fields. Okay, so this means that here this will also play an important role. And uh, so this is a, a representation um, of, of um, SUN. And so, because we have these fermion fields, we have a we use totally anti-symmetric representations, and we consider a, a young tableau with uh, Q boxes. Okay, here I'm. Yeah, yesterday I was careful about the factors of n, but here I mean there's this little Q and, and n which we discussed yesterday, but here for, for some reason I didn't write it. I'm sorry. Uh, I should have been a bit more careful because um, you know there's this quotient with n which we discussed yesterday. But let me say again, we have to impose a constraint uh, here because we are just uh, uh, allowed for more degrees of freedom by doing this. And just to keep the number of degrees of freedom fact fixed, um, we have to impose this constraints on the charge density. And um, so let me also say that by writing this, we introduce a spurious U1 symmetry because we can rotate these fields. And um, so this, um, um, this new U1 symmetry will actually now be spontaneously bro broken. And okay, then the condo interaction, which in spin space was an interaction between this current, which uh, have, so psi are the electrons and chi are these uh, auxiliary fermions here. Uh, then in the large n limit, so when n goes to infinity, we can use fields identities to um, write, well, we can always use the fields identities, but in the large n limit, only one term survives here, essentially, uh, which is the so-called double trace operator because it's a product of two, um, um, two separately gauge invariant operators, which involve one of the uh, electron operators and one of these um, auxiliary fermions here. And um, okay, so as was already discussed a long time ago, um, the the screen phase uh, is then characterized by a condensate. Okay, so in the large n limit, you can have phase transitions also in such low dimensions, and um, so so the screen phase uh, corresponds to a, a condensate of this form. And that's precisely what we can realize in, in the holographic condo model, uh, as I'm going to show to you. So we can use this concept of a holographic superconductor um, to, to, um, to describe this model in, in gravity. So you are now? Mm -hmm. So this yeah. U1 symmetry, the uh, phase rotation of this uh, chi field, mm -hmm. Should it be local gauge symmetry rather than global? Then this condensate is not really gauge invariant, uh, isn't it? Mm. It should not be physically observable, right? this uh, rotation, yeah? base rotation. Yeah, I see what you mean. I mean, you say if, if we make this, uh... We could Only the left hand up. side is a physical yeah. SA. Yeah. Okay. I think you know if we just decide to consider it to be a global symmetry, then we are safe. Okay. Then this is just a. a I mean, I mean, I agree. You could say. I mean, this could be a gauge symmetry because there's no derivative acting here, so this will just cancel. Um, Well, I mean, okay, but if you have a superconductor, um, so say a BCS superconductor, there's also the, the gauge symmetry of electromagnetism that gets spontaneously broken. Um, so if you make it a gauge symmetry, then it's true that the condensate is not gauge invariant, but I mean, it just means that you break the symmetry. Mm. Is this a problem? I don't think this is a problem. Mm. It's very similar to yeah to BCS theory. So so that you also have a condensate uh, breaking your gauge D one symmetry, and then of course the symmetry is broken. I totally agree. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay. Now let me explain to you how to 
um, in the, the model that we constructed in this paper. And okay, so as I already emphasized many times, uh, it involves the coupling of a magnetic impurity to uh, a strongly interacting non Fermi liquid. Okay. Joanna? Yeah? Uh, I guess that there is uh, some difference between the uh, superconductor and uh, your theory, in the sense that the, in for the case of the superconductor, uh, condensation is a charged, while your operator O is not charged. Yeah, so, you're right. Yeah, right. I mean. But maybe there is some analogy there. That's yeah. what you want to use, I guess. Yeah, okay, but yeah, thanks, Sandra. I mean, um, in any case, I mean, this this U1 symmetry is not really a real physical symmetry. It just appears formally because I write my spin operator like this. Um, and uh, and you just spuriously introduce a symmetry by writing your operator in a complicated way and then and then the symmetry gets spontaneously broken I think that's that's okay but I, I totally agree it's um, you know it's not charged under the symmetry I mean that's just the point because I mean it's not a physical symmetry so it should better not be charged under the symmetry okay I, mean, I agree with you it's actually you do have an option that yeah. you could use Kai to be just a Majorana right if the whole purpose is just uh, using the Schrodinger representation, then you can use just a Majorana. Yeah, but if you, if you have a Majorana, then you don't have any, I mean, then you don't have this U1. <laughs> I mean, okay, right. I, I agree. I mean, maybe it's worth <laughs> studying what happens if you take this to be a Majorana field. I, I totally agree. Q will um, be trivial, yeah? constraint, large Q. Yeah. If it's Majorana, then. Yeah. Also, you know, if this is an SUN, I mean. And uh, actually, uh, I mean, that I don't see what is the, the object Q. Because Q? that's not physical or something. Is it charged, really? Do you want to identify that U1 as a real? No, 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 it's not, it's not the electric charge. No, oh, that's right. for sure not. I mean, it's, it's a, you, you, you kind of identify it with a kind of charge of this extra uh, degrees of freedom. You just choose this to be uh, this. I mean, it could be uh, something else. I think it's, it's meaningful to, to, to pick this, but okay. Um, I'm not sure this is the only choice you can do. But okay, let me say that all these things appear very nicely also in the in the holographic model. So you know, um, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, okay, so so you can see. I mean, many famous people <laughs> uh, have have studied precisely this model in condensed matter physics. So uh, um, so this this is Pierce Coleman, not Sidney Coleman. Okay, Thank you. Um, uh, so so. Um, Maybe you should look at these papers again. I think all your questions are, are answered there. Um, but um, also this construction is very very nicely realized in the holographic model. So um, maybe I can show this and then we can come back uh, to it. Okay. Um, so before I go into the details of the model, uh, let me tell you a little, give you a brief summary of the results. Okay, so that you can see that what I, I mean, it's going to be a little involved, but uh, I think this list is nice to keep in mind um, just to um, see why this is useful. Okay, so as in that other model where, okay, so there's a, here in this model, um, we have an, RG flow generated by this double trace uh, operator now, and precisely the same we will also have in the gravity dual. And we, I can show you on the gravity side exactly also this dynamical scale generation that, that we discussed. Okay, so there's this divergence of the coupling and so on. And also, uh, I can show you that there's some screening in the sense that the degrees of freedom uh, at the impurity get reduced. Okay. Um, 
So the, the key point is that, you know, in this large N limit, we can use the model of a holographic superconductor. And there's a condensate that forms in ADS2 space at the defect, okay, at the gravity dual of the defect. So as I already mentioned, we don't get this logarithmic behavior because the electrons are strongly correlated. And uh, rather of, than this logarithmic behavior, we see a power law scaling of the resistivity in the infrared uh, with, with a real exponent. But that, that's also something that happens in this Lattinger liquid description of the condo model. Um, okay, then uh, we can also um, consider uh, in the holographic entanglement entropy, and there's also some nice comparison to um, quantum field theory results. And um, then we can study time dependence, and uh, so this is very similar to time dependence that uh, is studied in the ADS-CFT correspondence, because there will be some so-called quasi-normal modes complex eigenfrequencies that determine the physics. And here, this has some very nice consequences also here in this context that I'm going to show to you. Okay, and this last point is really related to the SYK model also. So there's a so-called spectral asymmetry, which means that we see a so-called Fano resonance in the spectral function. And so this, I'm going to explain in some detail what I mean by this, but this is also something um, which is, very common in condensed matter physics. So it's very nice to see this here also. Okay, so, so you can see this model has quite of some of the features that I mentioned to you and, and you can do some nice physics applications that I'm also going to show. Okay. And this model is obtained, in, so at least it's motivated by a top-down brain realization just in the way as I discussed uh, this morning, uh, this afternoon for you. <laughs> um, so, and the model uh, is constructed from, from this configuration. Okay, so we start again with the NB3 brains, which give rise to our NX to four super Yamel theory. However, these, these three brains, they will stay in the background. Okay, so um, um, they provide the coupling between the electrons, uh, but I mean, they um, um, the, the, the physics really happens at the level of these pro brains, you know. Okay, so then we put a small amount of these seven brains, but we put them in slightly different directions than um, before, so the, because um, they were so zero, one, two, and three are the dimensions of the real world. Okay, but now before I had the D7 brain spanning in this direction, but now we put the D7 brain in a slightly different way, um, like this. And this means that so this will actually uh, the string stretching between D3 and D7, they will give us our chiral fermions, so our electrons in one plus one dimensions. And they live in one plus one dimensions because this D7 brain is only in the time in one space directions. It doesn't extend in those directions. And that means that these fermions live only in one plus one dimensions. Okay, so in this again, these are the internal directions that I mentioned before. Um, if we only have the D3 and D7, uh, this is still a supersymmetric configuration. But now we have to put the defect and this defect will actually break the supersymmetry also. And um, so, um, so then we put a, a small amount of the five brains and they, they just extend in the time direction and the rest of the dimensions is in this internal space. And, and that um, gives us um, precisely the fields of the defect and it will give a, a scalar mode uh, that will be dual to, to this condens this operator, uh, to this operator. Okay. And uh, so at the defect, we have this operator and this is a scalar operator. So it has a scalar gravity dual. But because the supersymmetry is broken, this, this field will actually be a tachyon and there will be some condensation. And, and this condensation is precisely our superconductor. Okay, and, and that corresponds to this RG flow that I described yesterday now on the gravity side. Okay, so because we have this top down realization, we really have all these, we can write down the Lagrangian for um, this fields on the field theory side. So 
the strings between these brains give us the chiral fermions. Um, the three five strings so between these brains and those brains, um, they give us these slave fermions chi, which appear from so the ones we discussed all the way along. Okay, so these ones. Okay, and and then finally uh, the strings between these two, um, which break the supersymmetry, they uh, they will give us a scalar field which is dual to the scalar operator whose condensation corresponds to the screening. Okay, so are, are there any questions about this? Okay, uh, let me go on for. About okay. you, uh, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. about five or seven string. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, your impurity. Or yes. Not, not an impurity, maybe the maybe analog of psi chi. Yes. Yes, correct. And uh, so is D5 brain is uh, 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 localized uh, at the zero, I mean, at the origin? Yes. Not yes, near the out. Yes, that's right. Okay. All right, I got you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, okay, so so this is kind of on the field theory side, and uh, so the open string picture, and now we go to the closed string picture. Um, so in the closed string picture, we have to look at the fluctuations of these uh, D7 and D5 brains in the background of the D3. Okay. And um, so mm, if you look at our paper, there's quite some discussion how to write down the, act the DBI actions and, and uh, which we have for all these brains. And it's actually not so easy. <laughs> and uh, so just to summarize, Briefly, so um, the D3 brains, of course, they give rise to a background of ADS five times as five as we had before. And um, the D7 brains, because they span in these directions, uh, they will rub ADS three times as five. And um, actually the, the dual action and will involve a trans-Simons field uh, in, in ADS3 called capital A mu. And this trans-Simons field will be dual to the, the current um, uh, of um, the spin, uh, the current of the electrons, okay? So, so here we have to be a little careful because now this current of the electrons uh, is, has really a space-time index. Before I only wrote the, um, the internal spin indices, which they are there on top. I didn't write them here, but um, this also has um, now a space-time index. Okay, so it's written in a more relativistic language. I, I think John Hugh asked about this yesterday, you know, if this uh, is also coupled to a gauge field, and the answer is yes, and so here, this is where it comes. Why this and, is abelian? Is it abelian? Yes, uh, well, I, we chose it to be abelian to keep things simple. In principle, you can also make it non-abelian, but then it will get very complicated. Okay, so we said, let's do the simplest possible thing. And the simplest possible thing is to make it abelian, okay. But uh, if for just there is just a one single brain, then the, yes. how do you have a ADS3 times S5? No, no, this is a probe. It's a probe. So you get the geometry from the D3 brains. So you have N D3 brains, and those give you ADS5 times S5. And then you put a probe brain, which then wraps ADS3 times S5. So that's why these D3 brains are very important. But your question is good because, um, I mean, this will be one, okay, so it's a technical point, but one issue about this model will be that uh, the programs are always suppressed by one power of one over n compared to the background. And that's a little bit of problem of this model because, you know, each of these brains will be suppressed by one over n, but then 
the coupling between d7 and d5 will be suppressed by one over n squared because it's two probes. Okay, so your, your question is good because this is a feature which is a bit hard to understand about this model and which we then decided to ignore, which. <laughs> So that's why later we came up with this other model and so on. So, I mean, you know, this this top-down uh, discussion gives you a lot of motivation what your bottom-up model should look like, but uh, this model will be very hard to to solve, okay? Because there are too many degrees of freedom and they're all coupled to each other. Okay. Um, okay. So the answer to your question is. Uh, we have n d3 brains, they give us ADS five times as five, and then we put probes of d7 and d5, so where we ignore the buck reaction, and they will be wrapping subspaces of this ADS five times as five. Okay, I hope that answers your question. And we chose this to be abelian, so this means we have a U1 uh, flavor symmetry here in, in, in this problem. Okay, and then there's the D5 brains, they will wrap because they correspond to this defect. Okay, so then we have ADS, they will wrap ADS two times as four. And uh, there will be a young Mills field on this brand, which is dual to this uh, spurious charge density that we discussed. Okay, and there will be a scalar, which is dual to this operator O, which will condense. Okay, so then putting all together, we, we can write down a, a field operator map just as in the way I described before. So in ADS-CFT, you can really map, uh, have a duality between operators in the field theory and fields in the gravity theory, and everything needs to be gauge invariant, and that's, that's why we have composite operators, so no single fermions. And so the electron current will be dual to a turn Simons gauge field in ADS-3. This charge operator or the charge will be dual to a two dimensional gauge field in ADS2. And this operator made out of an electron and one of these slave fermions, this will be dual to a two dimensional complex scalar. Okay. So th that's the field operator dictionary that we obtain from. Uh, from our model here. Okay, uh, maybe I should skip this now. So, so okay, this is this other model which I'm going to discuss tomorrow, which is slightly different, but it has some features which avoid some of the problems that this model has. Okay, but let's talk about those tomorrow. And now the the upshot is that. The model I just introduced to you is very useful. It's top down. It tells us exactly which degrees of freedom we need for our convo model. But then it's too complicated. We cannot solve this. I mean, um, if we have all these coupled DVI actions, it's, it's really too complicated. So then we, we simplify our life by writing down a bottom up model, which has precisely this dictionary inside that I just derived. Okay, so the top-down construction was very useful to understand which fields do we need for, for our gravity dual model. But then uh, the action uh, itself, we, um, we just um, use some of the fields that appear in this top-down construction. And then, so here you see the model that we're going to use. So it has gravity, of course, so there's an einstein hilbert action. And then on top, there's a turn Simons action on ADS3 and some action on ADS2, just the terms that we need to implement, um, sorry, this dictionary. So we want to implement this dictionary, so we need an action which has those fields. Now, of course, uh, in the background, there's gravity. And then we have a turn Simons action for this gauge field, which is dual to the electron current. Okay, here I wrote this term, but we'll just consider the abelian case, so this, this the interaction term goes away. And then uh, we have an ADS2, um, which uh, is extends only in the radial direction, which is Z and time. Okay, so there's a delta X here. And that will involve uh, a gauge field little a, and then, um, as complex scalar, which will be dual to this operator O. 
And then we have to guess some potential because now we are bottom up and, and we take the potential to just look like this. Okay. Okay, and then we do exactly what Kuna Skalm was doing uh, in his lectures. So, um, because we want to do condensed matter physics, we need finer temperature. And finer temperature we obtain by um, taking the, the metric, which is the solution to this part of the action, uh, to be the BTZ black hole. So, this means uh, we have finer temperature because there's a black hole in our anti visitor space. Okay, and the, this ADS2 gate field asymptotically uh, will be related to this little q uh, in the charge density, and, and then there's also a chemical potential here. Okay, so I, I think this is a good point to pause now because I, so I, I motivated the, the model uh, that we're going to study. And so in, after the break, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to come back to this model and then um, solve the equations of motion and see the physics that we get from this, this model. But are there any further questions? Thank you, Una. Uh, it's of your scalar field phi is your, your operator O. Yes. So it's electrically charged. You have a covariant derivative notice on your DM, yeah? Yeah, but we have to be careful. I think now there, there's these two U1 symmetries. I think it's mostly charged now under this U1 symmetry, the spurious one. Uh, okay, what was it? This one, of, this U1 that we discussed before. Yeah. So, but uh, then uh, anyway, the phi is not gauge single it then. So you no, exactly. Operate to... Yeah, but that, that, that's just the, the point because I mean, you know, this this field will condense and that breaks. Uh, the symmetry will be broken. I mean, that's will be. Ah, it'll be broken. Yeah. Be, so there will be some Higgs on. Or, or yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm going to explain this. Okay, so that's just the point. I mean, the the, the screening will be the breaking of the symmetry. Higgs mechanism. It will be. The screening will be the the breaking of this U1 symmetry. So the, the, the operator dual to this field will condense. So that, okay, so there will be a solution above the condo temperature where this phi is just zero, okay? But then if we go below the condo temperature, it's going to condense and then there will be a non-trivial profile for this field phi. Yeah, that's precisely the idea. So D, D is uh, involved a small a, but not big A, that's what you want to say? Well, it involves this D involves both capital A and little a. So, so th this this capital A is the um, the, ga the gauge field for the ordinary uh, electric field. Isn't it true that the phi is a single edit? You know, with respect to this uh, S U N. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so there are many symmetries. Okay, <laughs> yes, it's a single with respect to S U N. So we have S U N. We have a U1 for electric field. We have a U1 for the spurious symmetry. Okay, so so so, so, phi, so is phi is a singlet of SUN, but it's it's electrically charged and it's charged under the spurious symmetry. So it is a charge. You mean phi is a charge? Though. Yeah. Okay. Be careful. So so we have SUN. So it's a singlet under SUN. Then we have a U1 for electric symmetry and mm -hmm. a U another u1 for the spurious symmetry so uh, the, the, what is the, your uh, I mean, notation representing the uh, electric u1 which gauge the electric u1 comes from from the electrons so no, there's from... no abelian no 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 i said that oh. this time is away i got rid eh? of this i i said that i i consider what? only the abelian i wrote this term here just to show that it's a transcendence but I consider only the abelian case, so this term is not what, there. So what do you mean by trace then? Well, here I wrote trace because it's in the way it's written there, it's a non-abelian, but then I say I restrict to the abelian case. And then the trace, of course, is trivial, yeah. So you, you, wanna, you have a two U1, and this will be yeah. broken to diagonal U1 later. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, very good. 
I think this is quite a lot of stuff. So maybe we should have a break now and then I come back at uh, so 10 30 my time. Yeah, uh, so. thank you so much yeah, for the very interesting talk. Thank you, Shane. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>